So welcome everybody to RTO District 23, third session on urban wildlife. And one six in, our, our speaker is Victoria Bedham. She's the communication director and educational director of Toronto Wildlife Centre, which is the busiest wildlife centre in Canada and a leader in wildlife rehabilitation. Today's topic is raising wildlife orphans and keeping wildlife families together in the wild. And before I start, um, they're going, I want you to know that they're going to be muting your mics. However, they welcome any questions you have to ask in the chat and we will um, make every attempt to answer your questions. So welcome to the third session. Welcome, Victoria. Great. Well, thank you. I'm super. Oh, yeah, I'm, I wanted to make sure my mic was on. Uh, very happy to be here again with all of you and um, to talk about wild babies today. So um, it's springtime and uh, the wildlife are busy making or having babies already. So um, we're going to be discussing uh, that today. Um, you know, the, the ways, best ways that we can keep baby wildlife safe and just going over a lot of things that you probably don't know about wild babies and how to best coexist with them. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I have a, a presentation for you so you get to see um, a lot of these little guys that we take care of at Toronto Wildlife Centre. Great. And as I'm going through, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and I will um, try to address them as we are going through. So I know that a few of you have joined us before for the first two presentations. So um, there are a few slides that will be repeating some of the same information, but um, I still like to share them because um, just to sort of reiterate that uh, you know, some of these issues sort of go across species and go across issues, and they're just really important to be aware of. So to get started with, though, a little bit of information about Toronto Wildlife Centre for anyone who doesn't know about us yet. Um, we've op been open every day since 1993. So that's every weekend, every holiday, seven days a week here to help members of the public um, who find sick, injured and orphaned wild animals and don't know what to do. So we admit typically in the past anywhere between 5,000 and 5,500 wild animals every year. But last year we had a record breaking year and we admitted over 6,500 uh, anim animal patients for care. So it was quite a busy year for us. Um, we admitted animals from over 300 different species since we've been in, and many people don't even realize that many different species either live in or pass through our cities. We have a lot of biodiversity here in the greater Toronto area. And our wild hotline, who you would call if you actually had an animal emergency, handles about 40,000 calls from members of the public every single year. So very busy hotline. And um, our wildlife rescue team, who are trained in doing really difficult, dangerous rescues that members of the public can't handle. So if a deer has fallen deep down into a pit um, or there's, you know, a loon stuck to the ice out on a lake, fro uh, flash frozen, um, that's what our wildlife rescue team will do. They don't necessarily just go and pick up all the animals. They do the really challenging rescues. And 1,000 animals are brought into our center every year through our wildlife rescue team. Through our education program, like today, we educate uh, up to 5,000 people per year, and we reach many more through our different um, social media channels, through our newsletters and e-newsletters um, to help people learn more about the work that we carry out. And we are a charity, so we aren't affiliated with, you know, the city of Toronto. A lot of people think that um, we do operate entirely on donations. We're a completely independent charity and we are the only wildlife hospital in the greater Toronto area. So I want to share a video now um, of some of our wild babies, since that's the topic today that we have in care. So you can see the wide range um, of babies that we've helped at our center.
as you can see from that video, uh, lots of different species of wildlife um, that we care for. And um, as you saw at the end, they're all being released back to the wild. So we're not like a zoo or a sanctuary where we keep animals um, full time. We only keep these babies at our center um, as long as it takes for them to, to grow up. And then we return them to, their, to the wild um, so that they can continue contributing to their species and to their ecosystems. Now, all of those cute little babies, um, come to our center for a reason. So I do want to go over some of those reasons today. Um, because even though we take really good care of the baby wildlife at our center, it's really better if they can stay with their family, right? Always best if they can stay with their parents in the wild. So we really want to focus on keeping wild families together. One of the big reasons we hear of at Toronto Wildlife Center why babies have become orphaned is because someone has trapped and relocated a parent. So for example, you know, a mother um, dens in somebody's attic or in somebody's garage or shed or, you know, a squirrel or a skunk, you know, digs a tunnel under a shed. Um, and the, the person living in that home only sees the adult animal coming and going and they think, oh, well, I don't want a squirrel or a raccoon, you know, living in my attic. And that is understandable. Um, they also don't want to hurt the animal. So they go and they purchase a humane live trap and they catch the animal and then they move it, you know, how, however far away, several kilometers to a new location. And they think, great, that's wonderful. We don't have to deal with that animal anymore. They're in a new place and happy. We're all good. However, two or three days later, they're going to start hearing crying from the babies because they didn't realize that that was a mother squirrel or that was a mother raccoon. And all of a sudden now they're dealing with all of these babies um, that don't have a parent to care for them anymore. They're essentially orphaned. There's no way to reunite them again with the parent because often they've been moved very, very far away. So this creates a lot of problems. It creates a lot of orphaning situations. Um, the other thing is relocated wildlife. Um, the adults don't tend to survive in the new location either. Um, they now have to find they're in a new territory that is already occupied by other animals of their same species. And they don't know if, where to find shelter. They don't know where necessarily know where to find food. You can imagine as urban wildlife being moved into a rural area, that's quite a different setting for them. Um, for raccoons, for example, live within a very small territory or in urban areas, it can be as small as three square blocks in the city. So moving them isn't in their best interest either, but because we're talking about babies today, really do want to highlight um, that it's a very dangerous decision to be trapping and relocating wildlife in the spring where there's a high potential for babies. Um, just because you don't see the babies with that animal um, doesn't mean that they're not a mother. The babies may just be too young to go out and forage yet, and they're just waiting in their nest or in their den site for their mother to come back. So, um, so that's uh, one thing we really like to highlight. Um, we do really try to promote tolerance. And when that's not possible, humane harassment. So for example, if, um, you know, if you have a group of squirrels that are living in your back shed that you never use, that might be a situation where we say, like, can you tolerate that? Can you wait, just leave them be until they're old enough, they will disperse after, um, you know, about 12 weeks when they're considered adults. And um, then you can sort of go about fixing that up. So it doesn't happen again. In situations where maybe you have a raccoon in your attic, um, you know, we, we promote tolerance for as long as possible in certain cases, especially if the babies are very young. Because even with humane harassment, there's uh, a risk that babies will be left behind. So humane harassment is a process of using light, sound, and smell deterrence to encourage the mother to move her babies to a new location. The idea is you light up the space, you make it a little bit noisy, put in smells they don't like, and then the mom says, you know what, this isn't my dark, cozy, comfy den site anymore. I, I think I need to move my family. But it's on their own terms rather than forcefully, forcefully being moved, which is a lot more stressful for them and can lead, uh, has a higher potential for them to lead to orphaning, leaving the babies behind. So on our website, um, if you go to the nuisance section, I have a, I have a problem with a nuisance, nuisance animal, um, you'll find different advice for all different species on how to do humane harassment um, to encourage that family to leave. 
Um, so we have them for raccoons, skunks, uh, squirrels, all sorts of different animals. Um, so you can learn a little bit more about that there. Now, sometimes humane harassment isn't possible depending on where the animals are located. For example, if a raccoon is standing in the third floor attic of a high, like of a tight, like a hot three-story level townhouse, and you know, as a senior, you can't get a ladder and get up there to get to get in there. Then there are times where a wildlife removal company may be necessary. Um, so when tolerance or humane harassment is either not successful or it's just not practical. Um, there is only one wildlife removal company that we would recommend, and that's Gates Wildlife Control. And the reason that we recommend them is because we have worked with them for several decades. And we know what their practices are. And they work hard to keep families together. Many people don't know that the wildlife removal industry in Ontario is not regulated. That means that tomorrow you could start up, you go get your, your business license. Tomorrow you guys could go start up your own wildlife removal company. You don't have to know anything about wildlife, about their natural behaviors, um, you know, the best way to um, solve the situation at all. Um, so there's a lot of really bad companies out there. Many don't have very much practical experience. Um, and they are the animals are exposed, unfortunately, to either intentional or unintentional inhumane practices. So sometimes they'll be, um, you know, babies will be left in attics to basically starve. Um, mother animals will be relocated away from their babies. So um, wildlife control is a profession in a field of study, just like many other professions are. It does take a great deal of knowledge um, to and experience to really master that profession. The thing we also hear on our hotline an awful lot is people calling us saying, I hired this wildlife removal company, I paid $300, and now I have orphan baby raccoons because they did a bad job. They're not coming back, they won't call me back, you know, they don't get their money back. So, you know, they, they're also at the expense as well. So, you know, whether it's Gates Wildlife Removal or another company, the things that you should be looking for um, if you go this route is that they offer you a customized plan and a firm price estimate written out for you that you can refer to. You know, verbal agreements are not, are not good. You want it all on paper. Um, the focus should be on long-term solutions. So they're not only just removing the wild family, but they're also gonna fix the problem in the first place because if you just remove the family and leave whatever hole or access point that animal has, a new family is just going to move in and you're gonna have the same problem all over again. And on that point, they should guarantee their work. So if they've done a good job, then animals shouldn't be able to get back in there again. Um, they should know about the behavior of the species that they're dealing with, um, understanding you know, ways to keep that family together, the best practices in terms of, of uh, keeping the babies safe while they're being moved. Um, and they should only be using humane live traps to catch adults. So no leg hold traps or anything like that. Um, and one way doors, this is a, they can be a really useful tool. It's something that they put on the outside of the hole of a roof, for example, that allows a raccoon to come out, but can't get back in again. It only goes one way. Those are great, except for when there's babies inside. So wildlife removal companies have to ensure first that there's no babies around before they put on any kind of one way door. And most importantly, they should release the live trapped animals on site. They shouldn't be taking them elsewhere. Again, the babies do need, the animals do need to remain in their territory, especially if there's babies, so that the mom can go and retrieve the babies and move them to another den site. So to avoid any of these problems to begin with, it's really a good idea to give your home an assessment. Really think about where could animals get into my house? So a few examples here um, that are very common that we hear about are chimneys. So you want to make sure you have a really good chimney cap that is screwed down to the, the brick or the cement beneath it. Um, because, you know, raccoons are very strong. They can get into small little spaces. So it really does need to be bolted down quite good. Dryer vents are another big one for animals like starlings and sparrows that like to nest in cavities. So putting a simple vent cover over top will prevent them from nesting in there um, and blocking off your vent. And depending on what kind of a vent you have, like if it's a, like a gas vent or something like that, it could be quite dangerous as well. Um, you know, soffits and fascia making their all repaired, 
um, making sure that there's hard wire cloth that you can see in that top picture, hardware cloth, sorry, um, that's like a metal square pattern. And that really is a good um, material to prevent animals like squirrels from getting in. Um, and window wells, we get lots of calls about babies that have fallen into window wells and have been separated from their parents. So covering up your window wells um, is a really good idea as well. Now, I know we talked about cats a little bit last time, but I am going to touch on it again, simply because we have a lot of calls about wild babies that have been attacked by a cat. And it's really, really unfortunate because it, it's quite preventable um, in the cases where it is a pet cat. So for example, a little baby cottontail rabbits like this cute guy in the middle, they live in nests in the ground, um, just a shallow indent in the ground and it's covered with grass and fur. And there'll be, you know, four, five, six of those babies in there. And the mother doesn't stay there with them the whole time for the exact purpose of not actually attracting predators to the nest. So once a cat finds that nest, they will continue going back until they've removed all of the babies. Um, in cases like little fledgling songbirds that are living on the ground before they can fly, they have no defenses against cats. They can't fly away. It's part of their normal natural behaviors and development to stay on the ground before they can fly. Um, but again, they're not able to um, get away from a cat. And even animals like little snakes, um, we, we admit that have to have stitches and antibiotics because of attacks by cats. So lots of different types of a young wildlife um, are affected. And the thing is that cats are an introduced species, right? They're not part of our native wildlife population. So they don't really have defenses. A lot of babies don't have any defenses against them. Um, and they do take a big toll. So we do encourage um, whenever possible, you know, keeping your cats indoors or keeping them supervised on a leash outside, really cute, being able to take your cat on a leash outdoors for a walk, or building some sort of structure that your cat can have outdoor space. Uh, like a catio is what we call them, a cat patio. So this is also good for cats as well, um, because there's lots of trouble that they can get into as well, such as car strikes, they can get into fights with other cats. Um, they can be preyed upon. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about coyotes, but also raccoons and great horned owls are perfectly capable of taking a cat as prey. Um, they can get into poisonous material, even become victims of cruelty. So um, lots of reasons for keeping pets and our wildlife safe. Um, there is a good website called catsandbirds.ca that offers lots of information on transitioning cat, outdoor cats to indoor cats, as well as lots of other resources like enrichment and how to build a catio and all of those types of things. So this is probably a bit of a familiar sight at this time of year. Uh, a Canada goose just sort of wandering around by itself in a parking lot, you know, on a street. And you might be thinking, wow, I wonder what that, that goose is doing there. He's just kind of hanging around, doesn't, doesn't want to leave. I can approach him really close. He's sleeping in the middle of the parking lot. Like, what's up? What's going on? We get lots of calls on our hotline about this. 99.9% .9 of the time. The reason is because there is a nesting female, Canada goose, up above somewhere. So that goose you're seeing wandering around the parking lot is a male and it's protecting <laughs> or keeping a lookout for the female that's nesting nearby. Um, in urban areas, it is very often that the, the female goose is nesting either on a rooftop or on a terrace or a balcony um, up above the street. Now, this can create a lot of problems. We get a lot of calls about this, about ducks as well as geese nesting in these areas. So we can see from this picture, this Canada goose has found a lovely patch of grass right by the lake. Seems like a perfect spot to a goose to raise a family. What they're not thinking about though, as geese is that that nest is several stories up off the ground. I think this one is probably six, seven stories high off the ground. Now, wild ducklings and goslings leave the nest after a few days and they walk towards water. So these little babies are going to have to jump off of this 
uh, terrace here to the ground to get to the lake. And if it's over two stories high, that can actually be fatal for them or cause severe injury. So many times our wildlife rescue team actually does have to go out on these, um, on these situations and capture the entire family and bring them to a safe water source like the lake. So this nest is particularly problematic because the goose hasn't even nested inside the terrace. We can see it's on the grass outside of the terrace. So it's really hard to control those babies from dropping off. The other thing that happens is that they'll jump to the inside part of the terrace, but we can see that there's walls all around. There's nowhere for the, them to escape. So they will either be trapped and not be able to parent, follow their parents to water, or they will jump off and hurt themselves. So those are the two issues that, that can arise. So I just talked about a lot of these things. This is a picture of uh, two of our rescue staff going out and catching a mallard family that was on a terrace. If you do live in an apartment building, a condominium, anywhere with these spaces, if you see ducks or geese nesting, it's really critical to give us a call right away so that we can track them. And as soon as they hatch, we can send out our rescue team to capture them. Um, things that attract them are um, planters, green spaces, green roofs, you know, green roofs as great as they are environmentally, they do attract wild birds to nest there. And so it's something that we have to think about when we're, we're considering our infrastructure in cities. So to give you an idea of what a rescue like this entails, I do have a video um, of our rescue team going to save a Canada goose family. Let me just get to my video. Um, that was had nested on an industrial roof and it has a lip around the top that they were unable the babies were unable to jump over and it can be as small as four or five inches. So I'll just play that now. One, two, three, four, five, six. So our rescue team is first counting the number of babies. One, two, three, How four, do we do five, this again? Um, to make sure that they don't leave anybody behind. Yeah, you're being left behind. Look the other way. Why do you not know how to follow? I'm just pocket you. Pocket him. that has been um, cut down to five minutes. Um, it takes a lot of time and patience to ensure that we get the entire family safely. Um. You got mom? You got mom? Okay. Ready? Yep. I missed him because I got. She has so a you can see how quickly yeah, yeah, yeah. they're panicking. Um, the father got, got away, um, and Sarah, our uh, assistant rescue manager, there, um, go was like, "Quick, quick! I got a gosling me? in the net." Yep. So they have to make sure that the He's gosling still around. doesn't I heard get injured him. Um, because it managed to get in the net with the mother. So they're going to quickly get that gosling out as fast as possible. Were you holding your husband? mom and the babies contained safely in, um, in a big pet carrier. They'll go on to look for dad. Sars! Ruth! So Stacy has just noticed that the father goose has 
has flown across the road to a roof. Uh, so that's complicated because it takes a lot of work to gain access to these spaces. We have to have somebody uh, give us permission to go up there. And we have no contact at the other building. Um, so that can be challenging trying to work our way up to the rooftop to try and catch the views. I've got another runner coming to you. Right now they're just focusing on catching all of the babies. Let's get them in the corner. Don't. So now they're safely contained and now they have to focus on getting dad. But what they're doing rather than trying to go on the rooftop and catch dad, which he would likely fly away again, Sarah is now holding up his baby. She's saying to the dad, hey, He's still I have up there. your baby yeah. here. Yeah. See, I'm holding your baby. Come down. And because father and Kennedy geese are so um, defensive and protective, if you um, go this it can be a way to get him to come down to the ground. And the baby's peeping and peeping, and that's what we want. You can hear Dad calling. He's not happy about it. I wonder if you drop them on that chunk um, of grass there. Which can add extra um, <laughs> difficulties when trying to do a rescue. So here comes dad flying down to the ground. He's upset that she has a baby. It's lip so swinging is the only thing. into a more confined space because it's really hard to catch a Canada goose just in, in the wide open in like a parking lot. So they yep. let him keep the baby and they've walked into a little corner here where it's going to be easier to try and catch him. And of course, this might be the last chance they have because if he gets spooked, he might fly off and not come back. So they have to be very careful to try and get him get the best shot possible. And then they're going to relocate the entire family back down to the lake all together. So you can see, wow, like quite a bit of work goes into something like that. And that doesn't even include all of the um, information we need to collect through our hotline, you know, getting access. Sometimes the building is not, the person who called us doesn't even live in that building. So we have to track down, you know, the, um, the superintendent or the owner of the other building. So it is quite time consuming, but we do dozens and dozens of these types of rescues every single spring. Um, May and June, we're just, we're just pretty much doing those constantly. Great, so I'm just gonna go back to my PowerPoint. So city infrastructure and wild families don't always go well together. There can be a lot of challenges for them. Um, so continuing on with water birds like Canada geese and mallards, um, they do need to traverse our streets um, to get to the water like I had talked about. So as they're doing this, they're contending with cars, they're contending with people. And something we see, unfortunately, too, is storm drains and sewers. So we can see in this picture here, that storm drain is pretty, has pretty big openings. So a little gosling or a little duckling can, can fall through quite easily as they're following mom. And this is exactly what happened in the next story that I'm about to share with you. Uh, so I'm going to show you the video momentarily, but um, it was reported to Toronto Wildlife Centre that this Canada Goose family was crossing the road and somebody witnessed, it actually was videotaping them and witnessed this little baby fall into the storm drain. And they started panicking, of course, like, what are we going to do? This little baby, poor little baby is down there. Um, they also contacted Blog TO, which if you're not familiar with, is a really big blog media um, <laughs> organization in Toronto. And um, the story just went viral. Everybody was um, going crazy about this little gosling that had fallen down in the sewer. So we had a lot of people calling us about it that day. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and share that video with you.
it is great. So boop, you see that one little guy fall into that hole. It'll repeat again in a second. So crossing a very busy street, and that's very common for Canada geese and ducks in the city. Boop, there he goes right down the hole. His little buddy almost fell down with him there. So, um, you know, our urban in infrastructure is really, really dangerous. So to continue on with that story, I'll just get back to my PowerPoint here. So Vanessa, one of our, our uh, hotline shift leaders was like, oh my goodness, this is just a, the person had just sent her a video, didn't have an exact address of where this had happened. Actually, the person that called us had actually only seen it on blog to so they had no idea they hadn't actually um, been out on the scene um, the person that took the video had posted it to blog to so she had to do a lot of detective work <laughs> to figure out how best to help this little guy so she looked around the video and was looking at the stores in the background and then she started googling all of the stores that she could see back there to get phone numbers for them so she found some of the stores she called them and said, hey, this is the story. We have a Canada gosling that might be in the sewer in front of your store. Can you please go out and check and let us know if you hear any peeping? So one of the uh, paper stores near there, actually um, one of the staff there was very helpful and decided to go, yeah, I'll go out and check. And she didn't definitely, yep, she saw, she heard the peeping. So uh, Vanessa alerted our wildlife rescue team and they were able to go out and open up the sewer and pull out the little gosling from the sewer. So here he is all wet <laughs> from his experience back at Toronto Wildlife Center um, in our incubator to get him warmed up. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to be reunited with the family because we weren't sure where they had gone to because of course they would continue walking. Um, but with Canada goslings, they do adopt babies from other families. So what our rescue team does is they go out and they look for the appropriate family. It's not something anybody can do. They do have to look for specific um, things about the family, including like age and size of the babies. Um, but they can introduce this little guy into a new family. So he would actually was able to still be raised out in the wild with the Canada Goose family. So it was quite a heartwarming story. Um, but, you know, just goes to show the, some of the perils that our wild families have to go through in the city and that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes Canada Geese are thought of as a pest, but, you know, when we can see that an entire city really got worked up about this story, um, you know, it gives us a little hope that everybody he does care and wants the best for our, our urban wildlife, as we can see from some of these comments here. I just want to uh, make sure the chat is okay. I haven't checked the chat. Okay, so no comments in the chat, so that's great. Um, so another thing that we see happening with wild babies that is separating them from their parents is people kidnapping them. So babies that um, they come across that are actually in a normal situation, um, but the person has perceived that it, that they're in danger. And so they've gone, gone ahead and captured them and taken them out of that situation. So if you do come across a wild baby ever, I do recommend checking our website, torontowildlifecenter.com. If you go to the found, oh, hello? Um, if you go to the found an animal section, there is species specific instructions for a wide variety of species from birds, squirrels, to raccoons, to skunks to assess if the baby actually needs help or not. And if it does, what you should do. So some examples of animals that are regularly kidnapped <laughs> include um, Eastern cottontail rabbits, because like I said, they nest in the ground. The mother just has the baby, she leaves them there, she covers them with grass and fur. And she doesn't come back except to feed them. So typically only around at dawn and dusk, the rest of the time they are alone. So a lot of people will find them and think, oh my goodness, they've been abandoned. I, I better take them um, when it's actually a perfectly normal situation. On our website, there is a test that you can do to check if a mom is coming back. It's called a string test where you lay string over top of the nest in a tic-tac-toe pattern. And if it's disturbed, you know, if it gets all messed up, that means that mom has come back to feed the babies and that they're perfectly fine. If it's not disturbed, then, you know, then you want to call Toronto Wildlife Centre for some more advice. Uh, fledglings that we've already talked about, part of their normal development, these little birds is spending some time on the ground, 
learning to fly, building up their flight muscles um, before they are fully able to fly. They can only really flutter and run. Um, their parents are around continuing to feed them. And as long as they're trying to run away and hide, it's typically a normal situation and not a reason to get involved. But again, people find a single baby bird on the ground. They don't realize that it doesn't actually need help. Uh, little turtles like this little snapping turtle um, also sometimes get kidnapped uh, because they are so small and all by themselves. Uh, like many reptiles, they actually don't need any parental care. As soon as they hatch, they're on their own. Good luck to you. Um, so as long as they're near a water source, um, then, or, you know, if you don't find them near water source, you can always call us and check and we can assess the situation. Um, but typically they are just fine and should be um, left alone. Um, another unfortunate uh, type of call that we get is um, situations where people have tried to raise a wild baby or have even decided to keep an, as a pet. So a lot of people don't realize that almost all wild animals are either provincially or federally protected. And what that means is that you actually need a permit to keep them in your care for longer than 24 hours. So you're allowed to contain them and bring them to a wildlife rehabilitator, that's fine, but you are not allowed to continue to care for them or provide any care for them really. And the reason for that is that a great deal of knowledge and training does go into raising wildlife. And what we find is sometimes people don't even know what species they have, but they're already trying to treat it but care for every different species varies incredibly. So for example, um, every baby has to have the right kind of nutrition. So when we're talking about milk or formula um, for domestic animals, there's kitten formula and there's puppy formula. And that's because they require different types of food. And the same goes for wildlife. So feeding um, kitten milk replacement or puppy milk replacement, or sometimes we hear goat's milk, um, to wild babies is really unhealthy typically for their system. Um, and it can actually lead to really, really big problems down the road for them. Um, also, if they don't get the right diet, um, it can lead to uh, issues such as metallic, uh, oh, metabolic, <laughs> oh my goodness, it's escaped my brain for a second, I'm sorry. It'll come back to me. A bone issue <laughs> that makes their bones weak um, and they're more prone to breaking um, down the line as well. So um, even a couple of days in the wrong kind of care can be really tragic if they're getting the wrong food. For example, a cottontail rabbit develops in three weeks. It only has three weeks before it's considered an adult. So every single day is critically important that it's receiving the right nutrition. We have to have, also have to take a hands-off approach. We don't snuggle and kiss and pet and love the baby wildlife as much as we would love to do that because they're very cute. Um, in order to keep them wild, we have to stay away from them as much as possible. And because we don't want them to be alone, because that's not good either, they have to actually be with other babies from their own species when they're being raised. So if you have a single raccoon, a single squirrel, a single rabbit, those babies will most likely imprint on you and will never be able to be released back to the wild. Um, they just won't survive. They'll think they're a person rather than their own species. Um, things like enrichment, a variety of enclosures, for example. Um, our raccoons start out in a you know, very small cage um, when they're young, um, but then they need to be moved to a big outdoor enclosure to spend um, the last few months of their care with us. And sometimes, you know, animals are in care for months. It's not just a few days or a few weeks you have to care for them. Some of them need care for a really long time before they're mature enough to make it on their own. Um, we also do have to monitor for signs of poor health, which may not be evident if you're not trained in wildlife anatomy and behavior. Um, and like I said, not, not getting the right care for any amount of time can really affect their well being down the line. I did just see something come in the chat. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Somebody just mentioned forgetting things. Welcome to my world. Metabolic bone disease. That's what it's called. <laughs> I don't know why I couldn't remember that. But thank you for the camaraderie. <laughs> forgetting things. So um, that brings me um, to our story of hot dog. 
So hot dog is one of our resident education animals. And he came to us as um, he was already an adult, but he had clearly imprinted on people. I'm just going to stop my share right now so that Ashley can share her screen because she's going to there. There he is. So this is hot dog. He's back at the center right now. Um, he's just swimming in his pool. So hot dog was um, taken from the wild. We're not sure at what age. Um, and he was he was kept by people for quite some time because he's incredibly friendly. He's not afraid of people at all. And the, the story that we have is that somebody had been keeping them, keeping him in their basement and in a big in a big tub. And uh, they moved out of the house and just left him behind. So we really don't know what his whole backstory is. The next person that came into the house went to the basement and found this giant snapping turtle living in this tub in the basement. So you can imagine they were quite surprised. But instead of calling Toronto Wildlife Centre right away, um, they did keep him for three more months. And they only fed him one kind of food, which of course was hot dogs, uh, which is how he got his name, <laughs> hot dog. So not a nutritionally adequate diet for a turtle. And um, he is on a much better diet now. So mice and greens and worms and fish, all things to keep him healthy. Uh, but he is one of our education animals now. He comes out to education events um, to help people learn about the importance of, of keeping wild animals wild. I mean, especially for animals like turtles and other species at risk, uh, removing even one mature turtle from the environment is, is making a big dent because uh, all of our turtles in Ontario are in trouble. And it can take anywhere from 10 to 20 years for them to even reach sexual maturity to reproduce. So if we take out a mature turtle, that's, you know, that's a really big hit. So um, he is a really friendly guy. Sometimes people ask us why we can't just let him go. And the reason for that is because first of all, he's imprinted on people. He would probably swim up to you in the lake and say hello um, if he saw you. And of course, that wouldn't work out too well for him in the long run. Um, but by law, we are also required to release animals right back where we found them. So we don't know his point of origin which means we can never release him back where he, where he originally came from. So we do think he would be happier living out in the wild. Um, but, you know, since he is imprinted, we did decide to make that decision to, to keep him with us um, as an education ambassador. Great. Thank you, Ashley, for, and Hot Dog for <laughs> visiting with us today. <laughs> Great. So I'll just go back to um, our show here. So what should you do if you find a wild animal? So I think I've mentioned it a few times now, just like to reiterate it. Really good to check our website first. That's a picture of what it looks like on our website. I think I found an orphan baby. You just click on squirrel, you click on raccoon or bird or rabbit or all the other species that are listed. And it will give very thorough instructions on um, what you need to look for and what you need to do. We are open seven days a week. You can give us a call on our hotline or we also have an online form available on our website and we can walk you through the next steps um, if they're required. Oh, I just noticed something in the chat here. Oh, somebody had to go. That's fine. So um, one thing that we will probably ask you to do in most cases is to first check if parents are around still. So right, like I said, we wanna keep those babies in the wild and we can only admit so many wild babies at our center. So one of the first things we want to do is to see if we can get those babies back with their parents. Um, sometimes people don't wanna do this. They just wanna get the baby the help that it needs right away. Um, and it can be hard to see them out there without, you know, food or water or their mom, but it is some, it's a very, very necessary step. Some people wonder why we say no food or no water. And the reason for that is that wild babies have to be given liquids very carefully. It's easy for them to aspirate, to get liquid in their lungs. If that happens, then we're in really big trouble. Um, you know, it can lead to them like suffocating. It can lead to infection. So that's something we want to avoid at all costs. 
And food also has to be introduced very slowly once they're warm and rehydrated, and it has to be the correct food. So very often people start filling their faces with really inappropriate food and way too much of it. And that can lead to constipation and bloat and diarrhea and can even be life threatening for them. So better to not give them anything unless we advise you to do so. Most importantly is heat. We can't stress that enough. Heat for a wild baby is life-saving. They cannot regulate their own body temperature yet when they're young. So even on a warm day, they can get hypothermic. So providing them with a hot water bottle or a sock filled with rice and microwave for one minute, or those hand warmers called hot paws or an electric heating pad on low or half of the box you have them contained in is going to keep them alive. It is more essential than any food or water that you could provide for them. So those are really the basics. Um, if you do find a wild baby, don't feed it, no water and give it heat. That's the first thing to do and then check our website to go from there. So reuniting is often successful and that's why we recommend it. I have a little video now um, that you'll see. We had advised this person that had found this baby squirrel to put it in a box with a heat source and put it back in the same spot where it had been originally found. And that's really important. We can't be moving the babies around too much because mom won't know where to find them. Put it back in the same spot and let's give it a day to see if mom comes and retrieves her babies. Cause sometimes it can take a little while for her to find them. Don't forget she has multiple babies most of the time. So it takes a while to move them back and forth. So we'll just watch this video now of a successful reuniting attempt. You can see the mom is coming down the tree. She just found her baby in the box. Got him in her mouth. And she's gonna carry him back up the tree most likely to another nest that she has in mind. So I think in this case, the whole nest had blown out of the tree. So there is no reason to think that the baby was orphaned. It's just the nest had, had come down. So a really good reuniting opportunity. Um, and in this case, this is a personal story I like to end with um, because even us that work at Toronto Wildlife Center, you know, we find these wild babies too and sometimes get frazzled also. Um, these are a couple of little um, sparrows, chipping sparrows that I had found. Um, I nearly stepped on one as I was walking my dog down our street and it wasn't moving away. And I thought, what the heck? Like, what is, it's clearly a fledgling, but it's like a brand new fledgling, like just left the nest. So still on the younger side of fledgling. Um, and sometimes when they first fledge, they are not that bright. They don't know to move away right away or to be afraid of people. Um, as I looked around, I found two more babies. Um, but luckily I could see that the parents were flitting around. They were very careful watching these babies. Now the problem was, as you can see in the picture on the left, it's a big school field and there was kids running around everywhere. I was like, oh my goodness, these babies are going to get stepped on. So the first thing I tried to do is move them to um, an area with lots of shrubs and grass, hoping that the parents would come over. Unfortunately, um, that was across the road and the parents kept calling the babies back. They do have a really strong instinct to stay near the nest when they first fledge. So they kept coming back across the road. So that was also another danger for them. So I thought, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? So I looked around and the only plant that was near where their nest was, which was in that pine tree, which you can see in the photo on the left, was that tiny little shrub. It was no more than a foot tall. So I had the option of taking them because they were in an unsafe area, which is not ideal. They had parents, right? So I wanted to keep them with their parents. So I discussed with a, another hotline colleague and we decided I would um, stay with them until dusk. And then I put them in that little tiny shrub where they indeed, they settled down in there. I can see the parents caring for them. That little shrub was enough for them to protect them from everything going on. The next morning I went back and checked. They were doing well. The parent had already called one of the babies across the road to the other side where there was a, lot, a big garden where they would be safe. And so I carefully moved the other two babies across the road as well to be with their parents. So you wouldn't necessarily obviously know <laughs> all of those steps. Um, but the big point that I want to make here that we need to think about as well in terms of wild babies is what is the habitat like? Um, the reason that these babies were in danger is because in cities, we cut all of the bottom branches off of our pine trees 
And we often have big open fields around trees. So there is nowhere for little fledgling birds to hide. And they really do need shrubbery and tall grasses. Like that's um, what they sort of have evolved with that they would be able to hide in to not be seen. So when we have just, you know, vast expanses of, of field in the school field, that can be dangerous for them. So this is just something to think about um, in terms of your own landscaping in your yard. Um, do you have a lot of spaces where wildlife in general can hide? So are there a lot of shrubs? Are there areas with tall perennials and grasses? Um, you know, are there um, limbs going all the way down to the bottom of the trees? We see this with owls a lot where owls have, um, you know, they've left the nest, they've flown down and they're called branchlings. And typically they would hop back up the branches to their nest, but they can't get up. So I'm not saying you have to remove your entire lawn. But some things to consider are just making some space for wildlife as well. So um, not only for shelter, like creating cedar hedges, shrubs, native shrubs, um, you know, letting trees have like their natural foliage, but also things like fruit, seed and nut bearing plants are a great food source for wild animals. Um, and leaving dead stems and stalks standing and leaves on the ground as well. That's great for insects. Um, it's great as a food source for birds in the winter and for uh, new, new young birds in, in the spring before a lot of their other food sources have come out yet. So we do have a program called Backyard Biodiversity. And you can find information on that on our website, lots of information and fact sheets, um, as well as on uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We share stories and information through there as well about how you can make your backyard um, sort of a, a more of a, of a, of a haven for, for wild animals by planting native species of plants, trees and shrubs. So um, like I always say, uh, each session, um, we're more than happy to have you join us if you're interested in the work that we do. We rely on volunteers across uh, departments. So you could join us on the hotline, which I run, um, you know, transcribing emergency phone calls. You can do wildlife care administration, carpentry, cleaning, whatever suits your fancy. Um, we rely on up to 400 volunteers a year in our busy season. Um, we really can't do the work that we do without them. So something to consider if you're interested. Um, and of course, like I mentioned, we are a charity. So um, if you love the work that we do, if you want to support sick, injured, and orphan wildlife, um, you could donate things like in-kind supplies, so paper towel, garbage bags, much, much more. I mean, there's a whole list on our website that you can see what our needs are currently. Um, speaking of greenery, like if you ever cut down branches or trees, anything like that, we can use that for animal enclosures as well. Um, and of course, like gift cards for gas for our rescue team, for example, are really helpful. Um, and of course, um, you know, monetary donations are always appreciated as well. Um, you can look on our website. There is a, a long list of different types of donations that we accept. If you would like to follow us, hear some more of our stories, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter are great ways to do that. We share different stories every day. Um, a lot of them are really heart heartwarming and, and you can learn a lot as well. So I do recommend checking that out. So hopefully I didn't go too long today. Um, and I appreciate all of your attention and more than happy to answer any questions that uh, any, any of you may have. Oh yeah, and just feel free to turn on your mic, Beth, and, and go ahead and ask as well. Hi there. Hi. That was just a wonderful presentation. I've enjoyed all of yours. You're a oh, great, great speaker and it's lovely to hear about the work. Um, I was aware that I have uh, a rabbit living underneath my deck and I have um, over the years tried to keep skunks out and all that. I don't mind rabbits, but once mm -hmm. they vacate, I want to I want to know when they vacate and how do I know that so that I can then close it up to prevent, say, a, a, a skunk next year or something? Yeah, that one's a little trickier for sure. Um, because, yeah, I mean, you could, what we would recommend typically is, is what kind of a deck is it? Does it have a big open space underneath or is it just one small opening? It's just one small opening and okay. it's very easy to get under it and I cannot see under there. Okay. And yeah, so... I mean, you could, if some, if you can get somebody to crawl under there and check that is best, but if not, um, what you can do is get newspaper and you can either tape it up 
over top of the of the entry entry point or you can crumple it up into balls and just stuff that entry point with those paper balls. Okay. What you're looking for is to see if an animal is coming and going out of there. Okay. So if they're coming and going, those paper balls are going to be disrupted and all over the place. Or if you tape up a paper, it'll, you know, they'll punch a hole in it. Um, Usually I recommend putting a slit through the paper if you're going to be taping it up just so that it doesn't knock the whole thing down as it pushes through. Mm -hmm. Um, if those, um, if those paper balls or that paper stays intact, um, then you know that there's not an animal coming or going in there. Um, it's hard to like rabbits because they don't stay with the nest. That rabbit would be coming and going pretty frequently to feed her baby. So if there were babies in there, I think you would know pretty quickly that, that they're there. So until, and the thing with babies too, uh, with rabbits, you can't do humane harassment. They're one animal that won't move the babies. So mm-hmm. you do kind of have to wait until they're, they're done. Fortunately, the babies are gone in three weeks. So, um, so once that those paper balls or that paper is in place for four straight nights, then you can go and, uh, or if you want to be extra careful, you could wait a week. Um, but if it's been undisturbed for a week, then I would say there's no animal living in there and you can go ahead and and patch up that space. Thank you very much. Yep. That's big okay. help. You're welcome. Well, okay. I would like to thank all the people who helped make this session possible. Maureen Capitosto, Vern Page, Merv Mascarenhas, Karen Quinn, and Mary Valtellini. And I also want to thank our audience for attending. It's been a pleasure learning all about urban wildlife with you. And I particularly wanted to thank Victoria. This was a lot of work that you've done over these three sessions. And it, it was a pleasure learning. And I loved, I loved being, <laughs> hearing about all these animals. It was wonderful. I want to tell the audience that we will, be, um, we will be putting out a survey. It will either come through the website or eBlast about this year's initiative. Um, when you see it, would you please take five minutes to fill it out and, re- and it, return it to me? Um, it's a requirement for our grant submissions. If, so we want to be in, um, we want to look good in <laughs> our grant submission, all our ducks for us. <laughs> Thank you. So on behalf of RTO District 23, Victoria, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank the audience for uh, participating. You've worked been great. Oh, thank you. It's Absolutely. been a pleasure. I mean, I really oh, enjoy. We oh. have two questions. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm in no rush. So I'm happy. To I'm sorry. Questions. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Vern? We just wanted to note that the recording from today's session and Victoria's PowerPoint slides will be available on the RTO District 23 website uh, within a few days. Well, thank you very much. And everybody enjoy the spring weather coming. And uh, see you later. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl, thank you for your leadership in this project. Just <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>